Hi everyone, my name is Dre, and I am the host and founder of the Dragon Network. So in today's video, I'd like to do a quick overview of TEFCA, the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement. So this is based on a webinar that I gave in mid-August of this year. And if you're actually looking for the entire webinar, there's another version of it that's over on my Dragon Consulting channel. So I'll link to that below if you want to have a little bit more in-depth conversation. But for this one, we're just going to stick to the key points and try to keep it under 10 minutes. TEFCA in general is something that resulted from our favorite piece of legislation in the U.S., which is the 21st Century Cures Act. And I say favorite, you know, jokingly, of course. So in that 21st Century Cures Act, which a lot of us know from the information blocking uh, components, there is also a section in there, which is 4003B, that indicates that the national coordinator, so the ONC, needs to convene public and private stakeholders to put together a framework of trust policies and practices that will support a common, a common agreement of exchange between health information networks. So the goals of this TEFCA framework, if you will, are to provide a single on-ramp to nationwide connectivity. To electronic health information is intended to securely follow you when and where it's needed. And the third goal is they want to support a nationwide scalability. So TEFCA, it's not just meant to be something in isolation. It is really meant from a creation perspective as something that could be scalable uh, across the country, sort of in every aspect. So the Trusted Exchange Framework is built on a set of common principles designed to facilitate trust between what are called health information networks. There's six main principles that the framework is built around. Standardization, transparency, cooperation and non-discrimination, privacy, security and safety, access and population level data. These are the underlying principles that are to be incorporated into the framework and that the framework needs to really focus around. So the common agreement, which is the second part, is broken into three sections, minimum required terms and conditions, and those terms and conditions are going to be developed by ONC, so the Office of the National Coordinator uh, in the US. The second layer is additional required terms and conditions developed by a recognized coordinating entity. So that's who's going to create them and that's something that went out to public tender. And then ONC will approve them before they're incorporated. And then the third component, a technical framework that is associated with QHINs. So those are qualified health information networks. And that, that portion of the framework was only added in the second draft. So the initial draft of TEFCA that went out for public review was just the MRTCs and the ARTCs. So the ONC side and the recognized coordinated entity side. And then that third framework that's really associated with the QHINs that came in in the second draft. The structure of uh, TEFCA overall and of the framework in particular is that there is a recognized coordinating entity that is going to provide oversight to qualified health information networks. And that recognized coordinating entity was something that went out for public tender. The tender was awarded to the Sequoia project. They're going to oversee the entire framework and process. So they're going to make sure that uh, things are being followed, if it's implemented or when it's implemented. And they are going to be the responsible party for sort of making sure that it's working. So underneath that are the qualified health information networks, and that can be a variety of things. So organizations uh, or entities would apply to become a qualified health information network, and that process hasn't been really fleshed out yet. Underneath these qualified health information networks, you will find multiple participants. So you've got an overarching body that is going to handle the exchange, if you will, and they're going to be doing the communicating um, and exchanging between each other. But within those QHINs are multiple participants. And those participants can come from a variety of areas. So it can be health agencies, it can be health systems, um, it can be individual HIEs. I should note that a QHIN could also be an HIE. So you might see a QHIN, for example, being a state HIE and a participant within that being a organizational HIE. Underneath the participants, so underneath those systems and agencies and the larger bodies, you're going to go down into uh, participant members. So that's where you're going to find the individual providers, individual payer groups, individual entities at the lowest level. So those fall as the participant members. So it's going to roll up again from participant members to the participant groups, if you will 
to the qualified health information networks who ultimately go up to the recognized coordinating entity. And then that recognized coordinated entity sits under the legislative guidance of ONC. So the other thing that this framework is outlining is the purpose of exchange. So what's the purpose of exchanging data back and forth? And what are we looking to provide a framework for? The purpose of the exchange that they've outlined, um, there's seven things that are on the list, and that is treatment, public health, and utilization. And all of those would only apply to organizations and individuals and entities that are Uh, defined as covered entities and business associates under HIPAA. Quality improvement assessment is also uh, under that area. We've also got um, individual access, which can be exactly like it says, individual access, determination of benefits, and for business planning purposes. One of the things that is being incorporated into, into this, which is a little bit different, is with the business planning, individual access, public health, quality improvement, and the goal of a true nationwide single on-ramp, there's a lot more opportunity for entrepreneurial business cases, I guess, to come forward. It is a framework that would lend itself to more innovation in the tech space and an easier mechanism or an easier way to sort of tap into that connection. The EDI that are included in the TEFCA are... Uh, essentially all three that we think of from a typical perspective. So it's the broadcast query, the targeted query, and then the message delivery push. So from a timeline perspective, what we're really looking at is, again, the 21st Century Cures Act is what kicked this whole thing off. The first draft of the TEF came out in January of 2018. The second draft of the TEF came about 14 months, 15 months after that. And that is where the push, push method of EDI exchange was added. And that QHIN uh, technical framework, that third sort of component of the framework. So again, we have the OMC portion with the minimum required, the MRTCs, and then we have the additional required ARTCs, and then the the QHIN framework came in after that. September of 2019 is when that award went to the Sequoia Project for the uh, public tender in selecting the recognized coordinating entity. And then the intention was to have the first draft of the common agreement. So again, there's the TEF and then the common agreement. The first draft of the common agreement is supposed to come out for public comment at some point in 2020. So there was uh, some anticipation that that would be released in the spring of 2020. um, But that anticipation existed really before COVID. It will likely go through two draft stages as well before it's finalized. So that portion of the timeline is kind of on hold. So what what are they going to do for how are they going to pe- get people to do this? Once they put this framework in place and once they have the common agreement out there, how are they actually uh, intending to get people to join TAPCA? So one is going to be business incentives. And that is, you know, if we have those entrepreneurial groups and those startups and those tech innovators coming in and and starting to really be attached to the framework and look at this single on-ramp and come up with some innovative ways to exchange information and and something that is got a, a good business driver behind it, especially at the consumer level. So if you've got it at the individual level or at the provider level, that's going to drive people to join. So that's going to put pressure from the outside in to sort of force uh, people who may not want to participate to sort of stay competitive. You need to get in there. The other thing that is frequently used in the U.S. in order to drive implementation and adoption would be regulatory incentives. So we don't know if there will be regulatory incentives that are attached to this. Everything sort of leading up to this point from 20, uh, 2009 forward with ARA indicates that, unfortunately, the industry isn't self-motivating and self-organizing into an interoperability state that we're looking for. So there's a high chance that there's some sort of incentive that's placed on this. But the business drivers, and the business incentives are going to be very interesting with this one, especially if it's got scalability. So that, in a nutshell, is what TEFCA is. I hope everyone has a great rest of their Friday or whichever day it is that you're watching this on. I have to figure out how to end my recording and have a great day.